Thank you very much for joining my presentation about the advantages of combining short read whole genome sequencing, optical genome mapping, and transcriptome analysis in the constitutional and cancer diagnostics. My name is Peter Nagy. I'm Chief Medical Officer of Praxis Genomics. What is our challenge? Only about 50% of the people with rare genetic disorders receives correct molecular diagnosis despite costly and extensive testing. Similarly, only a small percentage of cancer patients have their malignancies treated based on specific molecular alterations of their tumor. The goal of molecular genomics is to provide a molecular level diagnosis for difficult to solve inherited disorders and provide deep molecular analysis of cancers driving a personalized therapeutic approach for people with malignancies. The reason why microarray, targeted panel, whole exome, and even generic whole genome testing might not result in a genetic diagnosis are many. For microarrays, the most important problem is the limited resolution. Generally, they are not very good at seeing uh, copy number changes or structural variants that are smaller than 10 kilobits. The, they also fail to detect copy number neutral, uh, um, copy number neutral structural variants, such as inversions and translocations. They fail to provide a precise position of duplicated segments and breakpoints. So you see that a certain uh, piece of the genome uh, is in increased dosage, but you don't know actually uh, where it is located. Targeted testing, such as panels, often miss variants because simply the wrong test is selected. Panels often do not contain syndrome-causing genes. So if the phenotype based on which you select the panel is part of a syndrome, it might not be present in your panel. Also, the ordered test might be out of date. Panels grow at a quick pace as new genes are being discovered. How about, however, introducing a new gene in a pre-designed capture panel requires redesign and revalidation. So sometimes the panels are lagging behind what is actually already uh, known. Technical limitations of uh, targeted sequencing is that they often lack mitochondrial genome assessment, even though mitochondrial mutations can cause uh, the symptomology that you are interested in. And also, they have extreme difficulty to call copy number and structural variants uh, because of the targeted cover coverage. Targeted testing using exomes is a better option However, uh, this also has its limitations. The obvious one is that it is limited to exons, exonic sequences. So it, it lacks the pathogenic variants that are uh, outside exons. Another big problem is that because of the targeted capture, in the case of small exons, the exon intron junctions often are poorly covered. And when the coverage uh, requirement is not fulfilled for the analysis pipeline, variants that are present there will not be called. Uh, CMV and structural variant calling is difficult and often not provided. Even if it's provided, uh, it is low resolution, especially for small exons. It is also important to note that if the copy number variant is larger intronic and just partially overlaps with the exon, those copy number changes will not be called generally. What I mentioned before is that copy number neutral structural variants are not detected with exome sequencing either. So inversions and translocations cannot be detected. Um, Exomes also often lack mitochondrial genome assessment, and they do not work uh, for repeat expansion detection. 
So what is the problem with genomes? Most commercial genomes do not analyze or report structural variants in the 50 base pair to a 10,000 base pair range. The reasons for this are simply that our current reference, GRCH38, uh, is not perfect. And so softwares like Manta, which is relying on chimeric reads, detection of, of fusion reads uh, representing these translocations, uh, provide a large background noise because of the problems of the reference. And very few labs take the, take the effort to actually sort through uh, this large number of uh, reported structural variants and pull out the ones that are important. Genomes also uh, are able to detect repeat expansions, such as fragile X, uh, but the sizing is not uh, exact and not precise. So another technology needs to be used to size the detected uh, expansions. Another shortcoming is that genomes cannot characterize, genomes based on short read sequencing cannot characterize large repeat contractions, such as seen in FSHD. And of course, then the, the general problem is that the limited understanding of the effects of the variants detected, uh, which is due part to the fact that uh, a large proportion of protein coding genes still have not been linked to disease, and also in part to the fact that uh, structural understanding of the proteins that are linked to disease sometimes is not sufficient to predict the effect of the variant that we see. So how can we increase the sensitivity of genetic testing? And not just the sensitivity, but specificity and also the speed of getting a result. So the current paradigm is uh, multiple individual uh, test submissions that uh, are done over sometimes years and uh, waiting for the results. Uh, the patient uh, often is stuck on this journey that doesn't seem to end ever. So I want to show you how we uh, propose to simplify the currently used paradigm with our preferred paradigm. So FSHD testing, karyotyping, microarray analysis, and repeat expansion testing can be uh, greatly helped or, or basically replaced by bionano sapphire optical genome mapping. And uh, for microarray and repeat expansion testing, genome sequencing will be necessary to be applied at the same time as bionano optical genome mapping. The, the reason for that is to make the breakpoints more precise, uh, which genome sequencing can do when used together with bionano zephyr optical mapping data. And the repeat expansion uh, testing, uh, genome sequencing is better for the short repeats, sizing, detecting and sizing short repeats, while, while bionano optical genome mapping is better at sizing large repeats. However, panel sequencing, exome sequencing, mitochondrial genome sequencing, mitochondrial depletion testing, and uniparental disomy testing can be replaced by genome sequencing overall. And so really we, what we are proposing that instead of uh, these uh, nine or so uh, tests that people generally uh, submit for their patients, you would just submit two tests, an optical genome mapping test and a genome sequencing test. And once you find variants that are difficult to make sense of, you can do transcriptome sequencing for functional assessment uh, and confirmation of the, uh, the effects of the variants. So 
to make this uh, paradigm more uh, accessible to people, we perform or we propose to perform uh, the reporting in three stages. So we do a whole genome sequencing analysis, but we report first out the basic exome, then we upgrade to what we call the expanded exome. And if we still don't find the, the explanation, then we report out the whole exome. The nice thing about this architecture is that uh, it saves the patient money because he can only he or she only needs to uh, pay the difference between the prices uh, of the testing and doesn't have to submit a new sample. So we define basic exome as uh, coding regions plus minus 100 base pairs and all known pathogenic variants irrespective of where they are found in the genome. Single exome resolution, CMV calling, mitochondrial genome, and, uh, which includes uh, structural variant calling and deletions. The expanded exome is building on the basic exome and it contains a reporting on the repeat expansions. So basically it uh, adds a screen for repeat expansion disorders. Whole genome sequencing adds on top of that uh, single nucleotide variant CMV and structural variant calling throughout the genome and mitochondrial depletion assessment. So if after the, the set of tests, you're still without an answer, we recommend you uh, add optical genome mapping if balanced translocations and inversions are suspected and transcriptome sequencing for functional assessment of the significance of uh, the variants detected by DNA testing. So the same approach can be applied to somatic testing. In that case, you will use a paired uh, two more normal uh, sample set and it can also be used for carrier testing where you can um, help couples who have difficulty uh, conceiving or carrying through a pregnancy. It can also be used for single carrier testing where an individual with a family history uh, worries about uh, his or her uh, predisposition to cancer or neurodegenerative disorders. So what are the technologies that are supporting this approach? So high throughput sequencers came a long way in the last 20 years, and they allow uh, whole genome to be analyzed at a cost that previously was uh, unimaginable. So what used to be the price of an exome test, now we can provide a genome test for that price where, with a much higher uh, yield and a much higher uh, sensitivity. Also, keep in mind that the genome data uh, is your entire data set. So five years from now, when people have better understanding of variants and the significance of specific mutations in certain genes, uh, we can go back and, uh, and recheck your data. And we do that uh, readily. So the secondary analysis pipeline relies on uh, Illumina Dragon bio IT platform, which is a very quick and accurate alignment and variant calling uh, platform. Not only it provides uh, small variants, but it also reports out structural variants using Manta and copy number variants uh, using a, a coverage based approach. In addition, it also uh, notices and uh, red flags potential repeat expansion uh, that could cause various uh, spinal cell ataxias and other disorders. The other uh, main pillar of our approach is the uh, Zephyr optical genome mapping instrument. Um, this is basically a high resolution microscope that uh, analyzes individual DNA molecules uh, for stru structural rearrangements. 
So since this technology is a bit novel, uh, I'm giving a short introduction to how it works. So first of all, you isolate high molecular weight DNA and label specific sequences across the entire genome. So there are several labeling approaches, but the most common is a six base pair recognition site similar to a restriction enzyme recognition site, which results in a label being deposited every 1,000 to 10,000 base pair in the genome. So then you transfer the label DNA into cartridge for scanning by the instrument and then load, linearize, and image the labeled DNA in repeated cycling to scan the whole genome. So every line in this little panel uh, is represents an individual DNA molecule with the little green circles uh, representing the labels on every individual DNA molecule. And you see that the labels are different positions and the spacing is different between the labels on every DNA molecule. So once you, you um, uh, you examine several hundred million DNA molecules, you end up with uh, little contigs that you can see here uh, with blue bars in, in the second row, blue bars with, with black uh, symbols indicating the labels, right? And then from these contigs, you can put together uh, assemble algorithms will align molecules and de novo uh, construct a consensus genome map. So you basically create a barcoded genome just from your raw data. And then you, uh, in the last little square, you see you cross map across multiple samples or to a reference. So you take the informatically calculated uh, labeling pattern of the reference, which is here shown as the green, uh, bar with the with the pattern each each black line representing a label and then you compare that with your de novo assembled genome which is the bottom in a blue bar with the black uh, labels and you can see in this case the distance between the the, the black bars on the on the blue uh, track is greater than on the green tracks meaning that there is an uh, insertion happening there that increases the distance between the, the two labels flanking that region. So these are the, the outputs that you usually see with optical genome mapping. So the first one is a deletion where you see the reference, the green bar uh, has a wider distance between uh, two markers than the blue bar. And you see that with the orange sort of uh, uh, rectangle um, showing that. And then you can see insertion where there is bigger distance between the markers in the uh, in the sample and then in the reference. And here you see a widening of the rectangle towards the uh, patient sample. Repeat copy number changes uh, can show up uh, as you see. Um, in the repeat expansion, repeat array expansion uh, module, which is the second from the top. And then also you can notice tandem duplications when the same region of the reference maps to two adjacent regions in the newly assembled genome. For balanced translocations, you can see that the patient's uh, sample the blue bar uh, maps partially to two different reference chromosomes. The top one is, let's say, chromosome two, and the bottom one is, let's say, chromosome 20. And then you see the, the alignment uh, of the patient's DNA perfectly matches partially chromosome two and partially chromosome 20. Inversions show up uh, in a very easy to visualize or understand manner where the, there is this X-shaped arrangement where the corresponding uh, symbols or signals on the reference show up on the other end of the corresponding patient sample.
So the tertiary analysis is performed by uh, artificial intelligence assisted uh, software that allow the updated annotation and also prioritization of some of the variants. However, these softwares uh, are only used as, as a sort of as a consultant. So generally we evaluate variants without the artificial intelligence help. We just uh, also consult what uh, the artificial intelligence recommends at the end of our analysis. Genox is especially helpful because it allows us to combine optical genome mapping data uh, and structural variant data and CMV data in the same display uh, and also annotates these different types of variants together. So how to increase sensitivity of genomic testing by incorporating optical genome mapping in the whole genome analysis pipeline. I will show a few examples how this is accomplished. So for example, here is a case where a 70 kilobase duplication on the distal P arm of chromosome 7 has been noted. Uh, you can see the, uh, the chromosome on the top of this diagram, right? Uh, you can see a little red dot on the left tip, close to the left tip. That's the region that is currently displayed in Integrated Genome Viewer. You see uh, the blue bar uh, indicating the, the called copy number variant. And below it, you can see the actual alignment uh, sequence that shows a duplication, indicating that this region is present in three copies. So also in the same case, you see like a complete deletion of uh, the BRCC3 gene uh, and adjacent sequences uh, on the X chromosome. This is a male, so it's a hemizygous deletion. So you have a duplication and you have a deletion in this case, but then when you do the optical genome mapping, it shows uh, this region not with a deletion but rather with an insertion. So you see the distance on the, between the labels um, in the patient sample is greater than the distance between the labels on the reference. So there is an insertion of a foreign sequence in this region. And when you carefully examine the pattern, you realize that it's this UNCX uh, labeling pattern is showing up. So basically that piece that was apparently uh, duplicated on chromosome seven is actually not on chromosome seven, but it got inserted into uh, the X chromosome, re replacing a segment of BRCC3. So another important usage of, uh, of optical genome mapping is FSHD analysis, where it can beautifully size the DAS4 repeats uh, labeled with purple, and it can beautifully determine whether it's a polyadenylatable allele or not. So 4QA or QA, or it is 4QB. The patterns, the distance between the, the labels is different in the two. And it can also beautifully tell whether it's on chromosome 10 or it's on chromosome 4. As you can see uh, on the left side, the top three are uh, examples from chromosome uh, four, and the bottom three is on chromosome, bottom one is uh, chromosome 10. You can see the pattern of the marks are different. Sizing repeat expansions is, uh, is, is very easy and nice with this methodology. For example, for fragile X, you clearly see an increase in the distance as the repeat expansion uh, uh, grows, and uh, you can calculate from the difference uh, between the observed and the calculated uh, distance between the markers, the number of repeats. Similarly, you can use it in uh, myotonic dystrophy as well. Translocations are very nicely uh, showing. Um, this is a translocation between chromosome 2 
and uh, and 21 and this is how it will show up a uh, beautiful alignment of the markers to uh, chromosome 2 and 21 respectively so how transcriptal sequencing can help um, to make sense of the variance detected by whole genome sequencing and optical genome mapping so DNA is a storage of information, but the effects of mutations in DNA will show up in RNA and in the protein. Currently, we are not very good at analyzing protein sequence on a, on a massive scale, but we can analyze RNA sequence. So the effects of the DNA mutations can be observed and evaluated in the RNA sequence data. So we can observe the gains and losses in regulatory regions. So this shows a promoter and an enhancer. So the, the loopy snake-like part is the enhancer DNA that loops back with the different transcription factors attached to it. And then the little sports car like a picture with the Tata box shows the basic general transcription, transcription factors in the promoter. So mutations in this region, in these regions, will affect the expression level observable or on the transcriptome. And of course, mutations in the intron exon junctions, which uh, have some canonical sequences, the GU and the AG uh, in the donor and acceptor sites of the intron exon junctions. But there are other variants, uh, other nucleotides that have a role in, uh, in affecting splicing. So here is a case that demonstrates the use of transcriptome sequencing to assess the significant splice size variance. So in this case, there is a SYNGAP1 variant that is nine nucleotides away from the intron exon junction. And uh, you see it's a very well conserved uh, residue. And you want to know if it really causes a problem with splicing. And here is the transcriptome data where you show, see that the control uses uh, the two alternative uh, splice sites. Uh, at the bottom, you can see there are two uh, acceptable in-frame alternative splice sites. But on the top, you see that the variant shows up in the intronic region as green which usually that intronic region should be removed anyway. So it already shows that there is a splicing problem. And you can also notice that there is a third splice acceptor site that is not seen in the control, which will be out of frame. So this will mean that this variant actually is disrupting splicing. So Duchenne muscular dystrophy often caused by splicing. And here I show a, an example how you can demonstrate the absence of an exon uh, using transcriptome sequencing. Um, and also you can demonstrate the alternative splicing patterns that are taking place. So the yellow arrow indicates in the bottom section the control where that uh, has the exon 44 and the top one is the patient who is missing exon 44 and is skipping it in the transcriptome. Um, so the next case demonstrates how you can actually discover new disorders and, uh, and contribute to the scientific literature using transcriptome. So genome sequencing showed a homozygous deletion uh, affecting exon 3 of SLC44A1 in both affected siblings and heterozygous deletion in the mother and the father. Transcriptome analysis showed indeed the, the missing exon resulted in a skipping on the transcriptome analysis. If you see the top panel, the top transcription, transcriptome uh, profile, and in the bottom you see the three controls where exon three is nicely uh, in, involved in the generation of the process transcript. So, <clears throat> as you see, the current associations for SLC44A1 are that it contributes to exon pathfinding and neuronal development, highly expressed in differentiated oligodendrocytes, 
and is also uh, identified as a mitochondrial choline transporter. Um, joint genome and transcriptome testing identified a potential cause in these undiagnosed siblings. And uh, a recent publication came out with a similar phenotype in an affected person. And so this is how discovery can be, uh, can be done using combined usage of genome sequencing and transcriptome sequencing. You find a mutation using genome sequencing and you can immediately analyze it functionally using transcriptome sequencing. So to summarize what I have told you, combined use of whole genome, optical genome mapping and transcriptome sequencing provides increased sensitivity and specificity for constitutional and somatic diagnostic applications. The data can be reanalyzed as medical knowledge matures without repeating the testing. So you have a lifetime uh, resource to find the cause of your uh, problem if the current medical knowledge doesn't allow its identification. And transcriptome analysis is a reliable functional assessment tool for uh, evaluating the practical significance of genomic changes identified. In addition, we offer a stepwise analysis of genomic data, exome, expanded exome, and whole genome, which can provide a financial uh, relief for the patients and also the providers. Thank you very much for your attention. Appreciate you uh, checking in. Bye-bye.